so 25 minutes is a little shorter, so I'm just going to go a little faster. 30% faster. Are you ready? Okay. So uh, since the development of agriculture, the human population has increased by roughly 1,000x, um, you know, over 7.5 billion. Now the slide is out of date already. And um, I think that when people, like, wrap their heads around this, they're like, oh my gosh, it's 1,000x. Like, uh, you know, that's way too many people. There's this basic narrative. It's like, well, if all the people, you know, start to live at this, you know, uh, uh, at, at this level of comfort, or we were, or we hit the nine or ten billion that we're on trajectory for now. There's just too many people. That's the reason why it's so difficult, or maybe impossible, to make a sustainable planet. But I'm going to draw an interesting analogy that you uh, probably haven't thought of uh, before. But basically, if you were to take all the biomass of human beings, it actually turns out to be roughly the same biomass as as all the different species of ants together. So roughly 300. Million, uh, 350 million tons of biomass. Now, that said, human beings eat about 3% of their body mass per day, and ants eat about 30% of their body mass per day. So you do the math on this, very straightforward. It means that ants eat about 10 times more of the earth every single day than humans do, right? They're eating 10 times more of their body, you know, relative to their body mass. And ants are omnivores. It's not even just about being a vegetarian or eating animals. They, they're very much like us. They're social omnivores. Anyhow, we're not sitting around, though, thinking to ourselves, like, whoa, there's 10 times too many ants. They're, the world has gone to crap. Actually, in the process of having, you know, of eating 10 times more of the earth than human beings do, ants actually make the ecosystem healthier. They aerate the soil. They cycle nutrients. They, they, they provide a huge amount of ecosystem services, and ecosystem services that, that far outweigh what they're drawing out of the ecosystem. So even though ants are taking 10 times more than us, like in terms of direct mass consumption of, of the environment, it's, they're taking 10 times more than us. We actually don't worry about ants uh, at all because of the style in which they're consuming. And that style is easily described as, uh, and really it's the golden rule for ants, it's the golden rule for all species other than us at this moment, is that um, ants provide more ecosystem services than, than they do ecosystem consumption. And to the extent that all species participate in something like this, there's progressively more flourishing with the presence of more life. That's kind of how the whole thing works. We just kind of got out of this groove. So basically, the question is, how do we become a civilization that basically effectively is able to do the same thing? How do we become the sort of civilization that provides more ecosystem services than we do ecosystem consumption? Or you know, in other words, how could humanity become a net positive to nature? How could it be that every single year that we exist on this planet, nature is actually healthier as a function of our existence on this planet? I think that should be the target that we go for as opposed to just resource efficiency or even sustainability. Sustainability, the reason I think that sustainability isn't a strong enough target is that sustainability in terms of like releasing products in the world is always like this, this delicate balance between uh, technology, market, and, and ecology. And really, technology and market keep changing. So it's a very unstable thing that you're creating. When you get a company that is doing fully sustainable, closed loop, you know, perfect life cycle analysis, you know, stuff, and it's all working for five years until your product's not popular anymore. And then you have kind of a breakdown time period. It's like, well, let's pull this back. And we, you know, uh, like we wasted a little bit of material here. We re retool that way. That is actually a moment where you're net negative, even if you've built a fully sustainable product. So sustainability is actually not even fully zero. That can't be our target. We need to have it so that our existence is a net positive. All right, so how are we doing? Uh, the climate side, not super great. So uh, starting in the year 1750, we're about a 280 part per million concentration. And this basically tracks everything that we've done since 1750. This is a contribution from coal. Oh, yeah, and this is parts per million up over here. Parts per million of what? Oh, par, uh, parts per million in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide. And, and you can also, it's also expressed in gigatons. So you can go read whichever sat you prefer. But basically, um, through coal, oil, gas, cement, and land use, human activities basically uh, added enormous amount into the ecosystem. And if it wasn't actually for, for biology responding, thankfully biology responded, we'd already be up at around 570 parts per million. And if you guys remember that 350.org campaign, yeah, where it's like, oh, that's the line before catastrophic. 
Well, we're obviously way beyond 350 at this point. And if it wasn't for nature, we'd already be up at 570. Luckily, you know, since 1750, we had a couple hundred years of nature trying to respond. And the ocean has basically absorbed uh, 582 gigatons of carbon dioxide. The land has absorbed about 650 gigatons of carbon dioxide. And then the rest is still just hanging out in the air. And this is why the concentration, uh, I did this calculation and looked at the latest stats in October 2018. Might be a little bit more than this now, but as of October 2018, it's 409 parts per million. And it's basically this differential that is leading to, in the atmosphere, that's leading to major climate destabilization. Now, if you look at the, so nature's on our side. It's been trying pretty hard. It already pulled down more than a, a trillion tons, right? We messed it up super bad, and, and nature already pulled down a trillion tons. But even this is not like a perfect story, because the 582 gigatons that went into the ocean has already increased the overall ocean. And the ocean is a lot of mass. Um, it's, it, it increased the acidity of the overall ocean by 30%. So it kind of takes a lot to go increase the acidity of that much. Uh, and also, the ocean has absorbed most of the heat. The ocean has absorbed most of 93% of the heat just because it has more thermal mass. And basically, if the ocean had not absorbed 93% of the heat from the warming so far, it'd be something like 50 Fahrenheit hotter in the atmosphere already. So thank you, ocean. Anyhow, this is problematic. We can't keep doing this. We're, we, are, uh, we are on track to wipe out all the coral reefs within about 30 to 35 years. And we're on track to make it so that no shelled organisms can live in the ocean uh, in less than 100 years. So uh, we, we need to stop pretty soon. On the land side, uh, there's a lot that we can do. And we'll see that in the presentation. We need to go faster. OK, here we go. We talked about this basically. Uh, we're going to extinct corals from the, the planet in about 35 years. Once they're gone, it'll probably take about you know, 15, 20 million years for them to re-evolve. 25% uh, of all marine species live directly on the coral reefs. There's another 15% that either has their reproduction chain or their food chain go through the reef. So you're basically talking about extincting somewhere between 25 to 40% of all species in the ocean within 35 years. And then there's 1 billion people that are affected. Sometimes I say the ecological stats, and you're like, but how does it affect people? I was like, oh, fuck, OK, fine. It also affect, directly affects the protein source of a billion people. So if you only care about people, there you go. Here we go. Um, you know, you're wiping out 40% of all species in the ocean seems pretty intense to me already. Like, how's that not enough, people? Anyway, so the damage is la large and the time scale is super short. How do you actually go get this done? Now, my background, um, which I guess I didn't mention, is so I was one of the uh, founding team members of, of Google X. And, and I've invented a lot of stuff. Those are very prestigious rooms, so uh, it makes no sense to brag about anything. But this is, uh, so one of the things, though, that we worked on was the, the self-driving car. And there is a type of invention that I call an invention catalyst. There's, there are inventions that are just improvements on previous inventions. And that's just like, here's a thing, and it works a little bit better. But an invention catalyst is a thing where not only are you improving what a, a thing historically did, it also catalyzes you to be able to go think about how the, an entire system works differently. So why is a self-driving car an invention catalyst? And this is just an example of an invention, invention catalyst. And then we're going to bring it into the realm of how do you go uh, repair the ecosystem and become a net positive to nature through the invention catalyst lens. The, the, this is to motivate why we're talking about cars for one second. Um, so when we're working on a self-driving car, you know, there's a, there was a simple calculation that we did around what would be the impacts of self-driving. Because obviously, you have fewer, you can have fewer accidents and fewer deaths. That's fine. That's like a very direct type thing. But a thing that most folks are not talking about in terms of self-driving is that most people that own cars only use them about 4 to 5 percent of the time. Most of the time, it's parked. It's in your garage. It's doing nothing. So the utilization of a vehicle is about 4 to 5 percent. Now, if you had self-driving vehicles and people didn't own them and they just showed up at your house when you needed to go somewhere, you could make the utilization of every vehicle more like 40 or 50 percent and still have plenty of downtime for maintenance, charging, all the other things that you might need to do with the car. And if you can move the utilization from 4 percent to 40 percent or 50 percent, then you get 10 times more, more utilization. Even you know, adjusting for peak loads on transportation, you could reduce the number of cars by a factor of five, maybe even a factor of eight. So imagine going to any city and being able to remove 80% of the cars, you know, up to 90% of the cars in a, in a city. And we used to joke that, OK, and still having the same amount of transportation utility. Well, we used to joke that once the self-driving car 
actually was out there at scale, we could go around the cities and all the signs that said parking lot, we would go and erase the trailing letters so it just said park. Because right? we should reclaim like the 20% of surface area in cities that is just used for parking and like make it into things that, that really enrich life as opposed to just let a hunk of metal sit around. Anyhow, that's an example of how a, a thing which is a, seems like an improvement to a single function of a single object can actually catalyze the rethinking of an entire way of how cities are designed, how we live inside of them, and uh, you know, other useful things. Now, what are examples of invention catalysts in the world of, of dealing with, oh, one thing I forgot to mention about this, because this is very important for this uh, presentation. This much, if we wanted to go back from the unhealthy level of uh, concentration of carbon dioxide that we have in the atmosphere right now to a level that we know to be healthy, then we need to pull out about 1.015 trillion tons. So it really is a lot of mass. And like, there's a lot of things that I look at investing in and I immediately get rid of them because it is just, it's just way more mass than this invention or this approach can do. And I want you guys to be thinking about this throughout the entire weekend. It's like, how, where are you going to go? Okay, so when it comes to a trillion tons of mass, like the things that, that are able to store a trillion tons of mass, they need to be able to go safely store it. So it needs to have massive storage potential. And whatever approach that you do needs to have enormous mass flux. So it's like in a relatively short amount of time, you need to be able to pull that mass through. Now, you know, something like the ocean and the land obviously have enormous surface area. And that's why they were able to achieve a trillion tons of mass flux over the course of a couple hundred years. We actually need to achieve similar type of mass flux in more like 50 years, right? So I, I do think that, you know, there are ways to go accelerate things with the, with, the, uh, with the land and the ocean. But, you know, I think one of the potential amazing things about the people in this room is maybe you can help figure us out how to get the rest of that mass in there in a short amount of time, in a relevant amount of time. The reason I say relevant is the ocean will keep absorbing a bunch of this stuff. So you, if you can't do it in less than four or 500 years, the ocean will do it for us to the great detriment of all of life on Earth. So uh, we have a timeline on this. There isn't, we can't go slow, basically. Or it'd be non-meaningful to go slow. All right, so examples of invention catalysts in this space. So one of the companies I'm an investor and advisor for, um, it, it's called Biocarbon Engineering. They actually uh, went through Singularity and basically, uh, it's drones that plant trees. They can plant, at this point, they can plant 120 trees per minute and uh, at about one-tenth of the cost. So these are drones. They fire seed pods that have nutrients and a mycelial mix and all these other things to go support the growth of the tree. Depending on where we're planting, we get germination rates between you know, 45% up through 85%. So, but germination rates are pretty comparable to planting a, a seed in uh, by any other method inside of that, that ecosystem. So there's, there's no detriment to this. And obviously, because you can reduce the um, cost and time to plant so much, then you can actually just plant twice as much. If your germination rate was only 50% and you wanted to go to 100%, you just plant twice as much. Now, oh, and when you're able to plant 100 times faster and 10 times cheaper than the traditional ways of planting, then it also allows you to envision working on projects and at a scale that you couldn't do before. So here's an example of a quick walkthrough of that. So in terms of dry mass, like uh, in, depending on cellulose versus lignin content, then trees are about 48% carbon by mass. And trees, you know, uh, weigh somewhere, most trees weigh between two to 20 tons. Like a giant redwood is like 2,000 tons, but that's an outlier. The, most trees weigh between two to 20 tons. So this means that if they're 2 to 20 tons and they're 48% uh, carbon by mass, it, that means that each tree represents about one to, ton, ten, uh, 1 to 10 tons of carbon. Now, this means that if you are able to plant a trillion such trees, then a trillion trees actually fully, get, fully getting to maturity would be roughly a trillion tons of carbon. So you can get into the right effect range that you need. Now, what would it take to actually get to a trillion uh, trees? Well using the biocarbon engineering approach, here's the calculation as per our machines today. This is not even where they will end up, but as per the machines today, if we wanted to plant 20 billion trees per year for 50 years, which comes out to a trillion, 
then you would only need 9,000 drones, 450 staff, and about 80 million in OPEX in order to do that. Now, if you think about like 80 million in OPEX over the course of 50 years might actually fully pull down the trillion tons that we need, then this is in comparison to other proposals that we're looking at where it's like, oh, we, if we could just spend 50 trillion on blah. It's like, okay, well, 80 million times 50 is way smaller than, than trillions of dollars in any capacity. And in a lot of the uh, direct air capture fo you know, approaches, folks are talking about like, well, it's like 150 per ton, but we think we can get it to 110, or maybe someday it'll be 70. In a crazy, amazing world, it becomes 30. Well, you know, for us to go put a seed in a ground that ultimately pulls down a ton of carbon, it, it costs about, I think, 1.7 cents right now. So you got to compete. Um, not to say that you can't, because I know you guys have got some breakthrough stuff. All right, other things that might help us become a net positive to nature, other invention catalysts. So this is a company called Iron Ox. They do fully robotic organic agriculture from seed to harvest, and they're growing about 30 different uh, types of crops right now. Um, and it's basically, uh, we don't have enough time to walk through how everything works, but the food tastes delicious. Now, what, what does this have to do with humanity becoming net positive to nature? Well, it turns out that we use 40% of the land surface of the earth in order to go feed ourselves. And basically about a third of that goes to plant agriculture, two thirds of that goes to animal agriculture. And when we look at the ways that we are destroying habitats and, and you know, uh, doing a lot of carbon emissions through, through land use, a lot of this, like uh, folks are like, oh, well, we're deforesting the Amazon because of these timber companies. No, we are mostly not cutting down the Amazon for timber. We actually burn it down so that we can grow soybeans and graze cattle. We're basically mostly doing it to feed ourselves. We're not actually using hardly any of the Amazon for timber. And this is the same thing in, in Southeast Asia. We're just using it for palm oil. Those are not, you know, that's a type of agriculture. It's, so to the extent that we can change the, the way that we grow things that we eat, whether it be animal or plant agriculture, it allows us to go approach that 40% of all the land surface of the earth and use it in more productive ways for the environment. Now, what would iron ox look like practically here? Well, iron ox um, uses 90 to 95% less water, uses 90% less nutrient input, uses no pesticides, and can grow about 30x the density. So you can get the 30 acres of output that you would get from outdoor agriculture on one acre. And just to put that into like a more human context, it means that you could go feed a city of 100,000 continuously. All their caloric needs and more through healthy organic agriculture using two and a half square miles. Right, you wouldn't, so if, you, if your farm only needs to be two and a half square miles, you can put it way closer to those city centers, and then you also save on transportation costs and other things. So this is an example of a catalyst that allows you to reimagine a lot. And imagine you took the 40% of the earth that we use to go feed ourselves, you could shrink that by 30x. Well, now you're returning a lot of that earth to be able to use for other productive purposes. Now, like I said, only one third is plant agriculture, two thirds is animal agriculture. I'm also an investor in a company called Memphis Meats, which basically does cell-based agriculture. So it says, let's not grow a whole cow to go slaughter it and then make some steaks or burgers. It basically says, let's just start with some cow cells and make a burger or make some steaks. And basically, uh, in terms of caloric efficiency, it takes about 23 calories of input uh, over the course of the life of a cow to be able to generate one calorie of beef. And using Memphis Meats approach, it takes three calories of input to make one calorie of beef. So you already have an 8x reduction just in terms of the direct caloric conversion to the actual thing that we like to eat. And it tastes like beef because it's beef. And the duck tastes like duck because it's duck. Like none of this stuff has got like, you know, a hemi bee or any other thing that's added to it. Not, not that there's anything with hemi bee, it's fine. We all have it. But, um, you know, there's no special additives or formulations or pea protein in this special, you know, uh, whatever, uh, like suspension that makes it taste a particular way. It tastes like that meat because it is that meat. Now, I don't actually think that we should replace all animal agriculture with this, though I do think we should reclaim a lot of our, our critically, ecologically important lands uh, away from food production and do a lot more of this type of production. But for the places that are less ecologically diverse, we should still do outdoor agriculture, but do outdoor agriculture in a way that's focused on soil regenerative agriculture. And very quickly around soil regenerative agriculture, um, you know, the soil organic matter, you know, around the world, it, it averages not that high. Like, we've been burning down topsoil for, 
the last you know century roughly. But uh, you know the soil organic uh, matter uh, content is typically in like the one to two percent range, sometimes less than one percent. And these images come from a visit that I did to Gabe uh, uh, Gabe Brown's uh, ranch, and he's been practicing soil agriculture for about two decades. And over the course of that two decades, initially his land was just like his neighbor's land, which, which started out in less than 1% soil organic uh, matter. And I went out there with a team of soil scientists, and number one, they, they are averaging, you know, we did 100 soil cores, they're averaging 29 inches of Horizon A soil. And for folks that know stuff about soil, that's like the best topsoil. That's like the richest, most beautiful stuff. Most of the other farms around you, you'd be lucky to have a quarter of an inch. I think I need to be done in five minutes. Okay. Oh, shoot. This is amazing. Okay. No problem. Well, the main point here is that they went from, let's say, 1% soil organic matter content to more than 8.5% on average. And actually, if we could go and take just the land that we farm on, and we could move from 1% to 2.1% globally, that would also pull down a trillion tons of carbon. Right? So, like, we blew past the target that you would need to get you know, globally, if we could go convert our farmlands to soil organic agriculture. Okay, cool. Yes. Oh, I, I pulled up the wrong presentation. No problem. This is good. This is the shorter one. So another thing to go and know is that everybody's like, oh, it's just all about renewable energy, but it's kind of not, because electricity production is basically only 25% of it. You'll see that uh, this is why I've been spending a bunch of time talking about agriculture and land use changes. That's basically as much emission production as as all of energy production and transportation. Like people are like, oh, Tesla is going to go fix everything. It's, well, cars are about half of transportation. Transportation is 14%. So even if every car in the world was a Tesla and it was all the electricity for your Tesla was generated in a completely carbon free way, that would address 7% of emissions. So we need to get realistic about the scale of everything, right? And we need like a solve both on all the net emissions that are coming out and we need to go after pulling down the trillion tons of carbon. But very quickly on this front, the main battle that we've been fighting up until now has been a political battle that basically says, oh, hey, if I could go you know, get the right politicians to go change the policy to slightly reduce you know, uh, emissions so that, and the problem is, is that using a financial metaphor, something like the Paris Accord, as aggressive as it is, is basically like swapping out a high interest credit card for a slightly lower interest credit card you're still agreeing to rack up a bunch of debts for a good long time. And we already have a trillion ton debt. And even if we emitted no more carbon from this point on, the, the planet would continue to warm on average and destabilize for about another five to 800 years. So even if we've totally nailed this and we had zero emissions today, like we actually still need to pay off our debts. So we need to go characterize this. So I thought about this more like a debt problem or like a mass transfer problem. There's a trillion tons of mass in the wrong place that needs to be back down on Earth in a safe way. Plus, we also need to fully cut off you know, the tens of gigatons that are coming up like this. And this is equivalent. This is obviously between methane and refrigerants and carbon dioxide. All right, I kind of need to be done. Oh, the last thing, which is less related to climate, uh, this is, I just did a, did a calculation on how we're doing on plastic waste and basically calculate. This is all the plastic waste ever generated since uh, in the history of time. And, um, and, and there's a foundational study by Roland Geyer who uh, collected most of this data. But I calculated that we've created as, put as much plastic waste into the ecosystem since 2004 as we did in all of history leading up until 2004. So like the intensification of damage that we are creating is immense. It's growing much faster than population growth. And the types of plastics that we're using are also worse than ever. So if you, if you guys can go invent different plastics or ways of eating plastic or some kind of thing, but I think actually we need to go in there and interrupt primary production. It can't be about recycling, because once things are distributed and packaging to all the different corners of the world, just entropy-wise, it's too hard to recollect them. Some of it will still always fall through the cracks, and those things last for hundreds of years. And I just talked to a big packaging consortium, and I said, well, you think you're making a four-penny decision when you choose this material versus that, but you're making a 500-year decision. Right? You're basically deciding to negatively impact environments for 500 years. All right, yeah, yeah. OK, so we're going to be done, and we're going to do some Q&A. Here we go. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Um, so starting with question, I think Alison has one. Oh, shoot. Yeah. So um, real quick, we heard a lot about like amazing change catalysts. And I think that you know people know what the competition is here. Uh, what do you think, what do you personally think is like the thing to go after here in terms of uh, energy and air? Where do you think people uh, at this workshop could really make a difference though? Oh, I need to use that thing again. Okay, so you really need to focus on how much time would it take to effectively get a trillion tons of stuff out of the atmosphere using my approach. Because like every one of you guys are working at this nano level and like, you know, you need to go scale up whatever you're doing by 12 to 20 orders of magnitude. But like the unit economics of what you're doing is correct, right? So take your unit economics, go scale it up to 12 to 20 orders of magnitude, and ask yourself, great, how much time? Because that, that basically, it's, it's the amount of mass over time which gives you your mass flux, right? So if you say, how much time would it take to go use this approach? If it's taken more than hundreds of years or trillions of dollars, we're in the wrong category. If you're doing in the hundreds of billions of dollars and you can get, do it in decades, you're in an interesting category. Yes, more questions. Uh, can you comment on the impact of cutting down existing trees? Yeah, those land use changes basically lead to lots of carbon emissions because there's a couple different ways we bring them down. Uh, sometimes we just burn them to clear them for agriculture, and basically when it burns it, then all the carbon that was stored in it goes into the atmosphere. Other times we like, you know, uh, cut them and leave stuff to rot, and it becomes methane, which is another potent greenhouse gas. So land use changes. Uh, both in terms of removing the area that would be sequestering. And there's short-term sequestration where it goes into the plant matter and it continues to cycle through uh, you know, the cycles of labile carbon. And then there's long-term sequestration where through uh, you know, soil chemistry and, and uh, like the ecosystem that is the soil, then things basically progress to a thing called human, H-U-M-I-N. And that basically is a, a long-term, many you know, hundreds of thousands of year carbon storage. So we lose our, our ability to, we cut off that conveyor belt, and we create direct methane and, and uh, carbon dioxide emissions through land use changes. I think you said that if the oceans hadn't absorbed most of the extra heat, the atmosphere would have heated up by 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Uh, surely as we equilibrate, that's what's going to happen anyway. So don't we have a huge problem over and beyond the the excess CO2 in the atmosphere? Uh, oh, no, the ocean, it's water, so it just actually has more thermal mass. But it's still going to equilibrate with the atmosphere. It will equilibrate with the atmosphere, but they are equilibrating together. Like, the, the, the atmosphere did warm, and the oceans warmed together, and they are roughly at equilibria right now. Okay. I'm just saying that if somehow we were on a planet with no ocean, and we had just done what we had done carbon-wise, then and it hadn't absorbed all of it into its superior thermal mass, then you, it would be super hot, yeah. Uh, you you uh, pointed out that you could pull down a, a, a trillion tons of carbon by planting these trees over the next 50 years. Is there enough space uh, that you can get to to plant the trees on? It'd take about half the area of Brazil, but like, which is kind of big, but, um, but like a bunch of permafrost is melting, so there's all these plantable areas that hadn't been plantable before. Oh, wow. I don't know, that's just the world you have to work with. One more question. Related to the last question, so the drone, drones are in competition with natural seeding. If there's ground that just would not naturally seed, the drones probably wouldn't be able to get a tree to grow there, giving only that small um, uh, nutrient packet. So are you comparing how much carbon capture would happen naturally with weeds versus the carbon capture from the trees that you would yeah, so, uh, replace so, the weeds with. so there are a bunch of environments where, where nature will just reseed itself, and those are not the best candidates to come in and seed with drones. Now, in terms of putting seeds into the environment in a way that they're able to go and, and take root, there's basically the, uh, there's, there's several different steps in the series of, of uh, ecological succession. And, you know, I didn't talk about this, but like because you, we are planting individual seeds, we do not ever need to plant monocultures. What we do is we plant it through several stages of ecological succession. So if you need to start with a thing that would, uh, need, you know, be more robust and kind of set the conditions either in terms of shading the soil or other sorts of things that would make it possible for that next stage of ecological succession, then we kind of start with that. And then the other thing that we do is we have a fixed-wing drone that basically makes 
a hydrology calculation based on longitude, latitude, and topology that basically says, given the average amount of rainfall per month and how this landscape is shaped, here are the areas that, that will retain more moisture, here are the areas that will dry out more. And then we put the seeds in environment, we, we do the planting map as a function of the things that would be hydrology supportive of that, of that uh, seed species. Okay, last right, one. Thank you. One very, very last question. Yeah. Uh, so you were talking about ocean acidification. So that's driven both by CO2, but also by uh, nitrogenous wastes coming yep. off of, yeah. How do you do the split between those two sources? So nitrogenous waste, a lot of it has to do with redoing agriculture. And as you probably saw, I think we need to redo agriculture, just like a full top to bottom reset. Um, so like, just in terms of, because what's happening right now is we do a type of agriculture which actually reduces quality of soil over time. And it means that soil water infiltration and nutrient absorption, all these things are actually getting worse and worse. So the rate of erosion, like the amount of runoff, all these sorts of things are, are getting more intense year over year. And because of it, most of your fertilizer and pesticides are running off. You actually need to use more of it. So to the extent that you actually focus on soil regenerative agriculture and you can basically get uh, soil water infiltration rates that are high enough. So very quickly, like, we, like another set of things that we did on Gabe's ranch is we measured uh, soil water infiltration. And on most, um, on, on the average for US farmland is it can take about half an inch of rain per hour before, it, um, uh, before it, you start to get significant runoff or erosion. Right? So just imagine half an inch of rain per water. Oh yeah, I can see that running off. In Gabe's ranch, it could take 53 inches per hour before it would run off. So that's the difference between healthy soil and unhealthy soil. It is not a little difference. It's just that we've been practicing agriculture in a very particular way where we tear up the mycelial networks, we, we, don't, you know, we, we till it, which leaves it as bare earth for part of the time period. And the basic mechanism of soil health is green, green plants doing photosynthesis, generating plant sugars. And those plant sugars are the energy mechanism that runs the entire soil ecosystem health. And to the extent that we're tilling the soil, breaking up the mycelial networks, we're both cutting off the, the main energy source that drives that ecosystem, now we're cutting off its communication capability. And between the two, we've basically made something almost impossible happen, because almost always, whenever you plant things, it makes the soil richer. But we actually created a type of agriculture that could make the soil poorer, even though we plant things in it every year. It's amazing, we're amazing. All right. Okay. Thank you, thank you so much, Tom. Thank you.